Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Smith with Christian Travel Study Programs, and I'm sitting here in Istanbul today. The Topkapı Palace had lovely gardens with these fountains around it, and still today the Gohana Park is a place where people can come from Istanbul and spend time with their children and, and hang out. It's an ancient city that was the city of New Rome, Constantine City from the fourth century, Constantinople, today called Istanbul. And, and because of that, we go back to some of the early churches, places like Hagia Arini and places like uh, Hagia Sophia, this incredible structure that's still left from the 6th century AD. We also spend some time in the ancient Hippodrome, looking at some of the monuments that were put up there by Theodosius. Interestingly enough, all related to ancient times in the Bible. We, we travel through the city, and it's a wonderful city. It's filled with life and teeming with people, but we spend some time looking at some of the antiquities of the city at the Archaeological Museum, and then go across town and stand in the Grand Bazaar with all of its colors and smells and sounds. This was where East met West, and so it's a fabulous place for us to understand how commerce worked in antiquity. Now, Istanbul is fascinating, but what we actually came to study were the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3. And in order to start those seven churches, we're going to have to head south. So we go down along the Dardanelles and take a ferry across the Dardanelles or the ancient Hellespont. Then we had to get on to our seven churches. And we went to, to the incredible cities of Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum, the city of Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. These incredible cities that were so important to the biblical narrative. With each one of those cities, we picked out something that was super important for us to remember. These are exciting times, and when you're looking into Jesus' words, we're going to show you how being in the places will help you understand the narrative better. Join us as we go to the seven churches of Asia Minor in today's modern Turkey. Today, we are going to one of the fabulous cities of the Bible, the city of Pergamum. Now, Pergamum sat high atop a rock for its Acropolis and had a massive area down below, but it was in fact the best place to be if you were a pagan. It was the best zip code for paganism. And today, we're going to visit up on the Acropolis, see a massive theater, see its temples, but also take a short visit to the hospital center because after all, Dr. Luke was one of the companions of the Apostle Paul. Join us today as we make our way to Pergamum in Western Turkey. We're going to Pergamon. And the, in the Bible, it can be Pergamum or Pergamon. I'm using the New Testament, Pergamon, M-O-N, as the ending. It doesn't matter. They're all the same place. But what it was, was a Greek Hellenistic city that grew to be a powerhouse city under the Attalid uh, dynasty and actually was turned over eventually to, in a will, in about 133 B.C., it was turned over to the Romans as part of Western Asia Minor, and it had become a very important and powerful site. But it was more than that to local people. It was also a place of pilgrimage for the sick. So I'd like to spend a few minutes and talk about a group of people that we don't talk about a, a good deal outside of the Bible, sick people. The sick, the deformed, the disabled. 
Now, Robert Garland is a professor who I've turned to for a number of things related to the sick and the poor because he's written on the other side of history and he's really done some great writing. And so I'm taking some of the notes from him and adding some other things to it, but I wanted you to at least have him as a background. He always begins a lecture on a sick or disabled. He does many different kinds, but he always begins it saying, my advice to anyone who's planning on traveling back into antiquity is don't get sick. And the reason he says that is uh, if you drink the water, you might get sick. If you eat uncooked vegetables because using human waste fertilizer, you might get hepatitis. And you have to watch out for everything from potholes walking down the Hellenistic street to bolting horses to things like chamber pots being dumped on your head when you walk underneath the overhang. And so there's a lot of disease. We're going to see an impressive city. Everything you saw at Alexandria Troas is the opposite of what you're going to see at Pergamon. Because at Pergamon, you're going to see big restored buildings. It's a powerful place. You take a cable car to go up to the Acropolis and you are standing in the best zip code in the New Testament period for paganism. You're going to be in downtown Pagan Central where every god and goddess has a star on the sidewalk, if you understand what I mean. But people came to Pergamon from many, many places because of the doctors and the Asclepion or the hospital that was nearby. We have a doctor who's the writer of Luke's Gospel and of the Book of Acts, who probably, in order to go with Paul into Rome, had to make himself a slave of Paul so that he was able to go on the journey with Paul to Rome. So Luke is the kind of friend that sells himself into slavery just so he can go with you. This is a guy you want on your team. But Dr. Luke, in order to be a doctor, there weren't universities. There were Asclepion, and Asclepion is a, a sanctuary healing center to the god Asclepius. And... Um, you have to remember that in antiquity, we're talking about the period between, say, 200 B.C. down to the time of Jesus and Paul. There were, if you got sick and you were injured, there are no painkillers. There's no antibiotics. There's no anesthetics. And the way you have to deal with pain is through some very, very barbaric methods. And in fact, there's a fellow by the name of Archagathus who was in Rome. He was a Greek doctor who was in Rome, and they called him the Carnifex. Carnifex, carn, carnifex is the word for butcher. And medicine got its name from people who literally were practicing on you. And so you should know that medical intervention is one of the things that differentiates our lives from those in antiquity the most. In other words, most people in the biblical world, in the New Testament world, never thought of a doctor as something that you did before your last choice. Okay, at the last place, then you might go to a doctor. Now, it's it's rather unpleasant to think about, but um, imagine you're sick. Uh, it's very possible you have beriberi or dysentery or malaria or scurvy or rickets or pneumonia or typhoid or tuberculosis. These things were rampant in the Hellenistic period, rampant in the Roman period. And so we, we find that the Hippocratic text, Hippocrates from Kos, the doctor who gives us the Hippocratic Oath, the Hippocratic texts tell us of, of treatments for every one of these diseases, and that's how we know that all of them were common. So there was a, treat, a treatment program. Now, read them, and you will shudder at some of the treatments, and you will wonder how they concluded that that treatment had anything to do with that ailment. But that's part of what made it a practice. Honestly, if you were suffering from chicken pox or mumps or diphtheria or whooping cough, it could have been any number of things, or even cancer, you would get a certain treatment for at a long-term care facility, and we're going to visit a long-term care facility at Pergamon. Dr. Galen, second century Roman doctor, was at the Asclepion that we're going to visit. And so Galen's medicine that becomes the backbone of the writing of medicine as we have it from the Roman period will come from the site you're going to visit. So we're going to visit the Acropolis of the city for its paganism, but we're going to visit the hospital of the city for its purpose in the lives of many people that came there. Okay? 
you know, there were uh, a variety of cancers we know that also were a problem. And can I just say from the forensic archaeology standpoint, the most common thing we would find in the bones of people from, let's say, 250 B.C. to about 150 A.D. in that window of time of 400 plus years, um, the most common problem they had was a debilitating arthritis. The average lifespan of a person was somewhere around 42 years. So for those of you who are like me, much past 42 years, you are already dust in antiquity. Um, and, and that quite literally means, remember that one of the problems with those numbers, they're skewed downward because of infant mortality. So that causes them, the, it doesn't mean there were no 70 year olds, there were. Uh, there were certainly 80-year-olds. It's just that there weren't as many of those, and there was a lot more infant mortality. There was also a almost approaching 50% natal mortality. That meant when your wife said to you, honey, I'm pregnant, she is as likely to die as have the baby. Now, that's a hard thing for us to imagine, but it changes the way you're going to read Scripture because all the way through the Scripture, when a woman was pregnant, she was elated and afraid, and she had good reason. Now, if you're one of the poor or the downtrodden, you're, here's what's going to happen if you're sick. You're going to shrug off the pain because you've got to get up and go to work, and there's nobody to do the work if you don't do it. There's not another choice. So you're going to grit your teeth and go through it. But if you, however, can no longer stand the pain, you're going to have to First, make a dedication to a shrine. So the first thing you're going to try to do is go to a, a Herun. A Herun is a shrine of heroes, and you're going to look for one that has certain amulets, wonders, and charms that they do, all kinds of things, spells and incantations. They might dab your hand with herbal remedies or, or put the feces of a goat on your, on your neck. I mean, any kind of thing that they could do. And They've had, let's say, some success, and so you're, you know, maybe going to go there first. Let's suppose you're shocked. It's so controversial. It's shocking, but that doesn't work. Let's suppose that the goat feces on your neck doesn't take away your problem. It does, however, make your neck stink, okay? Um, I think the next thing you're going to do is you're going to look for one of the followers of Hippocrates. Now, He's allegedly born around 469 B.C. on the island of Kos. And um, Hippocrates is credited with being the founder of rational medicine, meaning medicine that's based on they tried it and this actually was a recorded result of what they did. You have to remember the part of the world that you're in right now is not a backward part of the world. The part of the world that you're in right now in the Hellenistic period had already given us the beginning of empirical science. From Talus of Miletus watching crabs on a rock, we get empirical science. And so from Kos, we get Hippocrates and we get the uh, wonders of 5th century BCE medical practice. But what he did that was different was he wrote down observations and made prescriptions and then followed them up with results. That's the kind of thing that we can track and grow in over time. One of the most important treatises that the Hippocratic school gave us, because a lot of times we say Hippocrates wrote, but we don't mean he wrote. We mean somebody who went to a gathering place that collected his writings and teachings wrote. So the Hippocratic school, one of the most important uh, treatises they wrote was called On the Sacred Diseases. And the treatise ridiculed the belief that epilepsy was a, uh, an affliction of the gods. They were trying to get away from God, goddess, superstition. So we call rational medicine sort of the science answer to superstitious medicine. Does that make sense? So the important thing is people are going to come to Pergamon, and one of the things they're going to come there for is it's a, it's a place to get rational medicine that is reasoned and thought through. And so as a result, they're going to do away with a lot of the purifications and incantations. However, Rational doesn't mean really rational. It's semi-rational. There's still a few incantations that stick around. There's still a few of the old ways and old medicine. And if you're going to plunk down your hard-earned savings, the first thing you're going to do is look for a doctor in rational medicine that has statue pieces hanging on his wall. You see, after if I went in and I broke my arm, and the doctor set my arm, and he wrapped my arm, 
and I went away and my arm got better, not only would I pay him, but I would pay him once when he did the work, come back and pay him uh, 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 an homage after my arm was healed, and I would stop off at a statue cutter and I'd get an arm that he could hang on his wall. Now, I know what happens for you. When you go into a doctor, the first thing you look for is his insurance statement, and the second thing you look for is his degree. Since they didn't have degrees, what you would do is look at his wall and see what body parts are hanging off the wall. Now, if it's doing arms and feet and legs, that's fine, but, you know, he does all the body parts. So this is really an interesting wall to watch. I mean, it depends on what he's had a lot of that season, right? And you can literally go to the statue maker. Can, can I tell you, in Corinth, when they first found the place of a doctor in Corinth, they found all these body piece parts in statuary, and the excavators went wild and thought, what kind of place is this? It must have been statue makers throwing away arms and legs. But no, these were hanging on the wall of a local doctor. So it was something that you would do. That's his diploma. That's the way you know that he's actually going to do a good job. So you look for, hey, I've got a broken foot. I look for feet on the wall. If I see a lot of feet, I mean, he's got a lot of foot experience, and that's the doctor I want. So you find a physician, and you agree to the terms, and he asks you a lot of questions about your symptoms and what your level of pain is, and he explains all kinds of things about your health. But most probably, what he's looking for is an answer to your body in what he would call the four humors. You're familiar with these. Um, you have in your body yellow bile, black bile, phlegm, and blood. And according to all the way up through the Revolutionary War in America, people still believed in the four humors. And as a result, the ailments were all about addressing a balance of the humors. And so they would, would deal with you in that way. So he offers a diagnosis. And he goes through and puts you on a strict diet. He might also give you some herbal drugs and remedies. Um, a couple different kinds of things he could do. There are 380 different herbs ascribed in the Hippocratic uh, lectionary or lexicon of herbal drugs. And so this is uh, something that's very, very old. And by the way, a lot of them work. When I first moved to Jerusalem at 19 years of age, I got very, very sick. I could hold no food down of any kind. I went to the modern medical center in West Jerusalem. They gave me something and I got sicker. And it got so bad that in my second week of archaeological school, I almost got on a plane and went home, but I, I was so weak I couldn't get to the airport. I literally dragged my mattress off my bed into the men's room and lay on the floor in the men's room because I just literally couldn't go down that hall. I was getting weaker and weaker. The school sent into the old city of Jerusalem and found an Egyptian doctor who was there visiting his brother. And the doctor said, I know how to help him. And I went to see this guy and he, well, actually he came out to see me. And I sat him on the edge of my bed trembling. I was just weak and just feeling terrible. And he brought in a bottle of clear liquid. It tasted like licorice. Um, it was, um, yeah, raka or Arak, or Sambuca, or Uzo, or whatever you want to call it. Depends on what country you're in. It was horrifying. He said, here is what you do, brother. You drink this. I said, how much? He said, all of it. Now, you drink yourself a bottle of Raka, and I'm going to tell you something. About halfway through, you will forget life, and the second half, you will hate life. He said, you're going to be very, very sick, very sick. Two days, you're sick. Then you're fine. <laughs> Guess what happened? I drank it, and I was very, very sick, very, very sick. And then the second day, I was fine. And I seriously never had a problem again with anything that I was eating or drinking in Jerusalem until I went back to the States. Every time I went home to the States, that's when I got sick again. Now, I tell you all that to say the herbal remedy was something that came back from thousands of years ago, and it still is something that works. It's interesting. If you go back and you read the Iliad, um, let's, sickness doesn't seem to have been a preoccupation of anybody. Uh, but all of a sudden, about the 5th century B.C., people start writing about getting sick. And just about that time, 
there's a hero called Asclepius around whom they catapult to a divine status because of his story. Asclepius' principal sanctuary is at Epidaurus in Achaia. It's uh, south of Athens. But um, he also has um, a number of other, 100 other Asclepia. And we're going to visit one of the large ones, the one where Roman Galen was, Dr. Galen. Um, what was the symbol of the medical practice? Do you remember? It's a stick with a snake, and that's still the, the um, snake coiled around the stick. is still the World Health Organization, and many doctors' uh, organizations have this. Now, the thing is, you're, if you have the option to travel to an Asclepion, you're probably having enough strength left in your body, but you're going to stay there for a while, so you're going to undertake the journey. And I want you to see that those places, when you went to the hospital, it meant you're going to be gone a month or more. You don't just go to the hospital. You're at the extreme end of the medical practice. And if you go to the hospital, plan on being there half a year. It will take them a long time to balance the humors within you. So healing sanctuaries came and they're long-term care facilities. And we're going to see one of them. And I really wanted you to get a sense. Why are people coming to Pergamon? Well, if you're not coming to worship, you're coming to be made well. And those are the two things that will be the center of the city. In fact, as a patient, you'd be housed in, um, and koimaterion is a, uh, it's a word for uh, kind of a dormitory place for the sick. And you'd be put in one of these, and a sleeping place, and you would be given various kinds of, we think they were opiates. Now, they weren't to take away your pain, although that wasn't a bad side effect. They were to cause you to dream and in hopes that one of the gods would speak to you and tell you what's going on inside of you. The ancient Greeks believed that your body often knew itself well enough to tell you something was wrong in the form of a vision. Modern doctors will tell you that uh, that sounds very foolish, but people often know their own limits and often know something's going on. As a pastor, let me just tell you, when people said to me, um, preacher, I'm not going to be here tomorrow. If they tell me and they're close to the end of their life and they say, I won't be here tomorrow, so far I'm batting about 100%. People know. They, they know a lot more about themselves. And so this was based on that idea. The medical profession has never been wholly divorced from its religious roots. And so in the Asclepion, although they called it rational me medicine, it really didn't divorce very well. And Galen, in the second century, who I mentioned earlier, claimed that Asclepius appeared to him in a dream. So even when you're talking science, just remember it's based on a lot of presuppositions and sometimes superstitions. And you see that. Um, it wasn't only when you were suffering from an illness or some other complaint that you were going to uh, need somebody of a medical profession. You might need a medic to per perform surgery on you. The most common place that you would go and get surgical procedures done was at your barber shop. Barbers pulled teeth, so they were also a dental. So it's cut your hair, pull your teeth. But they also were, or amputate your toe. So the most common place for surgery, and that, that, by the way, lasted all the way up through the 19th century in the West of America. People went into barber shops to have their teeth pulled. The whole idea of separating these disciplines into, uh, into dental versus barber versus surgical, those are all much, much later. One surgeon you engage won't, uh, won't give you an anesthetic because he doesn't have anything. So what, what is he going to do? Well, the most popular way in antiquity to put a person out was to take a fist and hit them as hard as you could on the chin. Literally, you knocked them out. That, by the way, continued through the Civil War in America. When they didn't have drugs, they just punched the stuffings out of you until you basically fainted and then they cut your arm off as if having an arm that's half hanging off isn't bad enough now he's beating on you okay and this is doctors you know were probably very very gentle when they got home because they've been beating on people all day uh, the the Egyptians by the way used opium 
But the Greeks, apparently, we, they use some things that we think may have had an opiate base, but we can't, we can't really uh, say for sure. If you were wounded, chances are good you weren't going to survive. In the Iliad, uh, the people who are wounded in the battle, as soon as they come back and they're put in the tent, they begin to confess their last will and testament. And it can be any size, you know, a, a, a hack in your arm. There was no way to stop bleeding. They did not know how the circulatory system worked, and so you would bleed out. When we look at Greek art, particularly when we look at something like, a, you know, the sculpture that they did, we're looking at anatomical perfection. So one of the questions people ask me all the time is, did people actually look like that? And the answer is absolutely not. They didn't. We can tell by the burials of people that these were people that were absurdly different than the, the idealized version that they had. But that's true today. You've all heard of Photoshop. You're looking in magazines, and there was a, a, a model. I can't remember who it was a few years back, and she said, it's amazing. I see myself in a magazine, and I've never looked that good. So she said, I, you know, they do so much adjusting. They'll lengthen my neck, change the length of my arm, you know, just anything they need to do, Photoshop, and make me what they want me to be. Now, I've been talking about people that are sick, and I've been talking about that aspect of Pergamum, but I want you to also know another thing that people came there for was long-term disability because they were seeking the gods because of their long-term disability. And you can look through various kinds of art and various documents from the Roman period, and you're going to find out that um, the International Disability Foundation estimates that about 10% of the world's population today is in some way disabled or has a disabling uh, uh, problem. And, and what's interesting if, is if you extrapolate that to go backwards, it means that there were many, many Greeks and then later many, many Romans that were in fact disabled. But what I want you to see is for many people, they came to Pergamon looking for hope. Now, here's the word after all those words that I was trying to get you to. They came for healing. They came to worship. But really, they came for hope. By the time you go to a hospital, you have been through the mill already, and there's not a lot of hope for you. And here's the thing. when at the, After years of dealing with this, people are just looking for hope. One of the smartest things I ever heard a clinician say, sat down with a guy who I was sitting in a hospital with, and the guy came in and he said, I've been to this clinic, and if I named the clinic, you would know it. And they told me, you've got stage four cancer. It's manifesting in these places. And the clinician looked at the guy and he said this, cancer doesn't come with a toe tag with a date. They don't know you're dying any more than I do. So get off the page that you're dying. Here's the fact, we're all dying. The real question is, how can we take care of the symptomatic problems that you're facing right now? And we're going to make this as good a ride as we can, as long a ride as we can. And you know what they did? They gave to that person who was hurting hope. So what people need more than food, more than drink, more than health care, they need hope. So I want you to feel when you're going into Pergamon, the sense of a pilgrim. Everybody's coming either to worship on the Acropolis or get better in the hospital, but everybody's coming out of hope. The very first place we're going to go, we're going to go up the cable car and go up to the Acropolis of the city. It's very impressive. And when we get there, I want to talk to you a little bit about what does it mean to grow up religiously in the Greek period? Well, who are these Greek gods and why do you care? How were they involved in your life and why would you come there? And then I'm going to flip that over to the time of Paul and of John and say, what if you grew up believing your hope was in Zeus or your hope for, let's say, I'm running out of food in my, in my pantry and I'm calling on Demeter to give me the cereals that I need. Where do you get hope in Jesus and how do you teach people who used to go to all the shrines to get their hope that they can find it all in him so hope is going to be our subject today by the way in your notebook and in the book that I gave you you'll notice that the symbol this is the third church Pergamum 
you're going to see the symbol is a circle with a person lying prostate worshiping because Pergamon is hope central through worship and wellness. And I want you to keep that in your mind so that as we go there, I think you're going to see that the site will come together and fit together if you think of it in that way. It's a huge city. It's a powerful city. has a fantastic library, one of the great libraries, second only to Alexandrian Library. And what's important is in that great library, you're going to have the first pergamentum, that is the parchments that are going to be there. And what's important for us is... It's all going to be a city based on hope. Okay, Pergamon is the site that basically from about 200 BC, 195 to 159, Eumenes II BC builds up most of what you're gonna see except for one major building that's added by the Romans. So it's a, we're gonna see a Roman site that's entirely Hellenistic, meaning when the Romans took over, it was already really well built. So they only added a little bit. So much of what you're gonna see looks very Roman slash Greek, remember? When the Romans took over Greece, Greece took over the heart of Rome. And they basically, what, by conquering them, were themselves culturally conquered, okay? So we'll take a walk up. Okay, you're, uh, where is the red dot there just above the seven? And this is the Acropolis, Acro above Polis City. The Acropolis, is your temple complex and your major entertainment centers. Down below are going to be other parts of the city. And you've been actually driving through the edge of it to get over to this side. The important thing for us is we're gonna only see two areas, the Acropolis area and the hospital area. No, the sick people didn't walk the hill. Okay, they were down in the lower city, but they came. So I told you there are two reasons people come to the city. Mainly, obviously people grow up here, they come to see their aunt, I'm not talking about them. The two main reasons are, they're all about hope. Hope in worship, hope in hospital, okay? The upper area, all these fancy buildings up here, will be built largely in the 200 BC. A uh, fellow by the name of Philoterus, after the breakup of Alexander's uh, kingdom, decides to revolt against Lysimachus, and he decides that he is not willing to be led by Thrace. He pulls away, by the way, the side story is he was carrying a large amount of gold for Lysimachus's army, uh, never showed up with the gold, showed up here with cash and prizes, okay? Showered gold on people, gave them a lot of stuff, and as a result, the city was very well funded from the beginning. Philoterus eventually dies in 263 BC, and a series of Attalids, the Attalids are Attalus I, Attalus II, um, Attalus III, they are ruling here. And the most important ruler here, Eumenes, is from 197 to 159 BC. Why is he important? Because Eumenes builds the library here. And he is, he is the one who pulls in most of the books of the world. Sadly, in antiquity, it took a great deal to keep a library going. So one person is speaking, 10 people are copying. Those things have to be changed every generation just to keep the scroll on the shelf. Uh, at one point, they are building one of the, the second largest library in the world. 
after Alexandria, incredibly important. But it tells you that there's Greek philosophical, um, oral tradition, poetry, philosophy, all of these things going on. And for our purposes, 133 BC, Attalus III, in his will, dies. He sees the handwriting on the wall. The Romans are too strong to defeat. And he gives Asia Minor and the cities we're going to be visiting, they all became Roman already built by Greeks. Does that make sense to you? So you're gonna look at a Greek city, I'm gonna call it Roman, but they didn't build it. They just took it. But they took it through being bequeathed the cities based on the will of Attalus III. And that's how most of the cities of Asia Minor come into the possession of Rome. For our purposes, what I want you to see up here are some of the worship places. Because in the letter that John writes, I know where Satan's seat is. Okay, I want to show you what he's talking about. I'm standing in front of a temple site. One of the few things that the Romans added to this place was the Trion or Trajan temple. It's begun during the reign of Trajan or Trion and finished during Hadrian's reign. And Hadrian is the one who actually inaugurates the opening of the building. One of the important things about Pergamon is that this is a site where coinage was used very early. It's not the first site for coinage, but it's one of the early ones. And so coins are being minted here. The coins you have in your pocket come indirectly from Asia Minor and from the Phrygian kingdoms and the Mycenaean kingdoms that minted coins early on. Up until that time, you know, the shekel in the Old Testament is a weight, not a coin. It doesn't have an image. That's why in the temple of the New Testament, they have to change money because there are images on the coins. And in an aniconic non-image worship, you don't have images on your coins of, of people or of living creatures. So as a result, the coinage actually starts uh, uh, in Asia Minor. Now, what's important for me is there is a very large cache of gold and silver in the areas of Asia Minor, and it's a very wealthy territory. Not only that, is it, it's agriculturally wealthy. So imagine where you've got solid wealth, solid military, and let's just say you've got a city with a strategic position for its citadel, you just came up partially by walking, partially by riding, and still might be huffing and puffing, okay? You have to really want to get up here to get up here. And the guy at the top of the hill, he's got the definite advantage in wartime. Now, big problem, if your Acropolis is up here and your water supply is down there, what do you do? But the Greeks had already worked out siphon water moving. So if you put, if you know that in the mountains up there, you have water that's higher than here, and you put water in a tunnel that is a straw that is absolutely sealed, meaning no air is getting in, you can bring it down the hill and then up the hill and water will go against gravity as long as there's suction in the line. You also have Archimedes' turn screw, the ability to help get the suction out of the line or prime the pump, as it were, to push the water up. So they actually have a way to get the water from those mountains down through an aqueduct that came down, then down and came up and in. Water is a big problem, but the, they had already by 200 BC engineered it. They had it nailed. This is one of the few Roman additions to the site. Most of the site already is in its full existence. Now, for time's sake, I want to cut to the chase and tell you why the site's important to us and what we should be looking for with what we see on the buildings. I want to read to you from Diogenetus, and this is the Epistle to Mathetes, and it may be one of the oldest apologetic documents of the early church. Based on the language and other textual evidence, it, this appears to have come from about the time this building was finished. Okay, now listen to what is being said of Christians at the time in which this is being inaugurated. Christians are indistinguishable from other men, either by nationality, language, or customs. They do not inhabit separate cities of their own, or speak a strange dialect, or follow some outlandish way of life. 
Their teaching is not based upon the revelries inspired by the curiosity of men. Unlike some other people, they champion no purely human doctrine. With regard to dress, food, and manner of life in general, they follow the customs of whatever city they happen to be living in, whether it's Greek or foreign. And yet, there is something extraordinary about their lives. They live in their own countries as though they were passing through them. They play their role as citizens, but labor under all the disabilities of aliens. Any country can be their homeland, but for them, their homeland, wherever it may be, is a foreign country. Like others, they marry, they have children, but they do not expose them, leave their children out for exposure if they're uh, maimed. They share their meals, but not their wives. They live in the flesh, but they are not governed by the desires of the flesh. They pass their days upon the earth, but they are citizens of heaven. Obedient to the laws, they yet live on a level that transcends the law. Christians love all men, but all men persecute them. Condemned because they are not understood, they are put to death, but raised to life again. They live in poverty, but enrich many other people. They are totally destitute, but possess an abundance of everything. They suffer dishonor, but that is their glory. They are defamed, but vindicated. A blessing is their answer to abuse, deterrence their response to insult. For the good they do, they receive the punishment of male factors, but even then they rejoice as though they were receiving the gift of life. They are attacked by the Jews as aliens. They are persecuted by the Greeks. Yet no one can explain the reason for this hatred. To speak in general terms, we may say that the Christian is to the world what the soul is to the body. As the soul is present in every part of the body while remaining distinct from it, so Christians are found in all cities of the world, but cannot be identified with the world. As the visible body contains the invisible soul, so Christians are seen living in the world, but their religious life remains unseen. The body hates the soul and wars against it, not because of any injuries the soul has done to it, but because of the restriction the soul places on its pleasures. Similarly, the world seems to hate these Christians, not because they have done it any wrong, but because they are opposed to its enjoyments. Christians love those who hate them, just as the soul loves the body and all its members despite the body's hatred. It is by the soul enclosed within the body that the body is held together. And similarly, it is by the Christians detained in the world in a prison that the world is held together. The soul, though immortal, has a mortal dwelling, and Christians also live for a time amidst perishable things, while awaiting the freedom from change and decay that will be theirs in heaven. As the soul benefits from the deprivation of food and drink, so Christians flourish under persecution. Such is the Christian's lofty and divinely appointed function from which he is not permitted to excuse himself. This is the second century, third generation after Christ, and this is their reputation and testimony, according to a document when this was being built in honor of the emperor Trion to worship the emperor. Let me tell you what it is we're looking at here. We're going to walk through here and we're going to see worship sites. But what we're really going to see is where do you get your hope? Because if you grew up in this town and you wanted wisdom, you sought Athena. If you wanted power, you came to the temple of Zeus. If you wanted to be recognized, you would come over and over to the various temples of the various people. I don't have enough crops, so I'm going to go to the Cherry's temple and I'm going to offer a sacrifice. And all of a sudden, let's just suppose you're in a marketplace, maybe in Lystra or Iconium, and you're away on a journey, and you hear of this one Jesus, and he is able to meet every single need you have. And, and you begin to question, and this one called Paul, or this one called Barnabas, or this one called Silas, or Timothy, starts to explain to you who Christ is. 
and he can meet your needs. And not only in this life, but he will meet, he will be at death's door to catch you when you fall into eternity. And, and you receive Christ and you are thrilled and you are excited and you meet a new family in Lystra or Iconium. And then you make your way back home to Pergamon. And you walk in and you are in the zip code for every God. The perfect place and your family doesn't understand where are you going to get your hope? Why are you hopeful? Don't you know that you're not going to have enough grain if you don't get to the Cheris Temple? Well, how do you expect to get wiser if you don't show up at the Athena Temple? No one's ever going to notice you. You're never going to be famous if you don't go to the Zeus Temple and make an offering. And you say, that's okay. Jesus, who you can't see, who has no buildings to honor him, is enough. I want you to imagine that John is writing to a church, but he's not writing his words, he's writing down Jesus's words. We're not going to study seven letters of John. There's seven letters of Jesus. They should be in red in your red letter edition. Jesus is writing to his church. And every one of these seven churches has a failing or a problem, but that's not the subject. The subject is Jesus's defeat of their troubles. So I want to talk about where hope comes from. Let's take a look. Now, let me, I brought you over here. I'm going to talk more about this when we get over there, but I, I want you to look out the side here for just a moment because what's important to me is that you see the theater. And characteristic, a theater from the, the Greek period has a full circle orchestra in the bottom. The orchestra comes from the word for a dancing goat. It's not something you need to worry about, but the orchestra is the pit, okay? And behind it, do you notice that there is a row of stones, like a wall, and the skene fronts, or the backdrop, would be standing there overlooking the valley, okay? And then you have the cavea here, or the seating, and it is very tight for 10,000 people to be seated up in there um, in and, and a very tight formation. When you're sitting there, you really have the sense that you're going to tumble down into the valley, right? Now take a look, and what you'll see is a semicircular orchestra. Remember that in the New Testament, when Paul writes to the Corinthians, he writes 1 Corinthians 13, and he says, Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, if I have not love, I become two things, a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Both of those come from the stage of an ancient Greco-Roman theater. The sounding brass were pits, uh, p uh, jars, pithoi, that are big brass jars that were along the front of the stage. And when the upper decks had gods appear, the voice of the gods was in the orchestra. And so you would have... You know, what you don't want to have, all of those ancient productions were about basically how the gods and goddesses mess with us, right? And so the lower deck of the stage would be people, the upper deck would be gods and goddesses. And so when uh, Zeus shows up at the top, you don't want him standing there saying, I am Zeus. Like, that's not going to do it. You want, I am Zeus. And so he's going to stand up in the stage and go like this, but Herman's going to yell into a jar that's going to be one of these brass jars that echo that says, I am Zeus. And it's going to be like the great and powerful Oz, right? The idea is you're supposed to feel, that's a sounding brass. If I speak without love, I'm just Herman yelling in a jar, it ain't real. Don't be taking that seriously. If I speak without love, I'm like a tinkling cymbal. It's the word for a copper sheet that was used to make the sound of thunder tinkling symbol doesn't quite get it for me, but nevertheless, let's give it up for King James. At any rate, the point is that you roll the sheet and you don't put up an umbrella. It's just a sound effect. It's not real. And he says, if I speak without love, if I'm not acting what I'm saying, it isn't real. I'm being an actor in a theater. Now, remember that the theater presentations included comedies and tragedies. And when this theater was operating, they were all the rage until the first century. And in the first century, they took on two new forms, the mime 
and the pantomime. Pantomime is something you do, one person plays every role, pantomime. And uh, it sounds, it looks a lot like um, Tai Chi and thing in the garden there with uh, somebody plucking a harp and people going, you know, like this. It's a kind of ballet rich movement with song going on in the background. I know it's not riveting stuff, but it was what they played during the intermissions, pantomime. Mime was Saturday Night Live groin humor. It was entirely debased humor. And as a result, he, uh, uh, people would come here and they would be laughing uproariously at the mimes that were coming out with a six foot phallus attached to them and making obscene gestures. And it looked like the Super Bowl intermission. Okay, but this is the theater for 10,000 people at, at Pergamon. I want you to walk over to this side with me, if you will. If you feel like I'm pulling you, it's because I'm pulling you. Often all you're seeing of these buildings are the under structure, but you can see the difference. Like you'll go out to an archeological site and you'll see all those gray stones, but over top of them would have been the white or gray marble. So you're only seeing the bones, not the flesh. I want you to imagine now how impressive this temple with an upper deck here, side aisles here, an open area, and then a temple building like this. This, by the way, is junior league compared to the New Testament temple, okay? It's a tiny one compared to the one in Jerusalem. But it was pretty impressive. And getting everything up this hill, that's pretty impressive. I want you to take a moment and listen to the letter to the church that Jesus writes when he writes to the church at Pergamum. To the angel of the church at Pergamum, write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which faithful Antipas, who was a faithful martyr, was killed among you where Satan's seat dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name which is written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Now, I want you to stop and think about just the few nibbles we've had so far of the site. We're going to see more, but you've got a 10,000 seat capacity theater. And you take a look at these temples, and there's one after the other after the other. And we passed by two major ones coming up that we're going to circle back around and see. The Athena Temple, and we're going to see the great altar of Zeus that has been so well preserved and restored in Berlin, but it belongs here. And we're talking about Zeus, the god above all the gods at Olympus. From the time of Hesiod, from the 7th century BC, the gods of Olympus became part of the backbone thinking of the superstition and the energizing mythology that drove Greek life. So the Greeks that build this and the Romans that so sort of swallow them up, all the Romans did with all the Greek mythology is replace the names. You replace a Zeus with a Jupiter and on you go. They didn't do any more than, they didn't even change their character, they just replaced the names. And what I want you to see is that long before the birth of Christ, Pergamum was a city of the, uh, uh, with its own empire. This literally was built up when it was the capital of its own mini empire, but by 200 BC, uh, the, the Attalids were reigning here, and by 133, they were ceding it over to the Romans because they knew it was no longer going to be holdable. So the grandson of Attalus I, Attalus III, will will it over to Rome. Now, the important thing is that this is, a, this is about oh, 16 kilometers from the sea. So there's a sea route not very far away, which means commerce was done by the sea. Remember for the Greeks, the Aegean Sea is the FedEx highway to get things back and forth. You need to be somewhere close to the FedEx highway if you're gonna be a, a, a key point. 
But this is also an area that was agriculturally rich. You saw that coming in, didn't you? There's a lot of agriculture. The vineyards were so, the vineyards here were so important, were so rich. The wine was so good that eventually it came, when Domitian, who is around at the time of John's letters, becomes emperor, he sends a letter to Asia Minor saying, I want you to go out and I want you to tear up all your vineyards. Why? Because the Italian, Italic winemakers are upset with me because you're challenging their wines in the contest. Tear up your vineyards that you've had for generations because it's more important to me that I keep the home fires going. And so you guys, I'm sorry, but you need to stop being good winemakers. This was an incredible, uh, an incredible area. And what I want you to see is that it was also a pretty good day for the gospel. Here in places like per, uh, uh, Pergamum, you have the people that had seen so much political maneuvering and they had seen so much power and spending of money that there were people that were coming to Jesus. And some of you might remember that uh, before he was 30 years old, Alexander the Great conquered the known world, which gave the world one culture. And, and what's important about that one culture is is they were using one language, one system, but more than that, they had a worldview that allowed the gospel to spread dramatically throughout the Roman Empire. It was Roman in name, but Greek in language and culture. The gospel spread in Greek far faster than it spread in Latin. Eventually it becomes Latin, but in the beginning it's Kine Greek, and that's why we're studying Greek and not Latin in our, in our seminaries. When the place got cut up, and these kingdoms became separate kingdoms, there was an opportunity. And Philoterus built himself a kingdom, and he built a strong one, and he built a powerful one. But, but one of the things that's cool is to see how the hand of God was at work. Because while all these kingdoms were being made, roads were being made to intersect them, worldview was being cohesive, language was being carried, and it was getting ready for Paul to walk around and, and spread the gospel, and, and John to come and set up churches, and Timothy to work, and all this was being set up. God was moving the deck chairs of nations so that he could uh, tell his story. Now, the most important thing I want you to remember about Pergamum, I put it on your sheet, and if you have the sheet, I want you to be able to see the picture, is there's a circle with a person worshiping here, and I want you to remember that when Jesus writes to them, he's well aware the thing he says twice is that he knows exactly what's going on in their town and it's evil worship. It's evil worship. But I want you to remember something. You can't work in a guild without having a temple. So your union is wrapped up in your religion. If you go to the Hephaestus temple, you're part of the uh, uh, Metal Workers Union 109 and, and, and you think of your religion as your part of your job and your commerce. So imagine Acts 15 telling you that you, can't, you have to get out of the temple to stand for Christ. Imagine growing up in Pergamum where you started off with every God available to you, which tells you every trade is available, which tells you there's lots of economy and work here. And all of a sudden, now you're following Christ, but how do you pay your bills? How do you feed your children? So there's already this compromise that people are working out. Look, I really do love Jesus. I really do follow him. He really is my savior. But if I had to just put a pinch of, of incense in the altar once a year at the Trajanium so that I could say I honor the emperor as God, doesn't Jesus understand? I have kids. Come on. Do you really think he expects my children to starve? You see it? And there were people that were preaching a compromise. Do what the world does so that you can be who you think you are. And the problem was, that was a language of Balaam and Balak. That was a drawing you into, just let's make it easier. Can't we just make the faith into bullet points so that we could kind of do it easily? The right zip code to be in if you're a pagan is Pergamon. The problem is, if you're gonna stand for Christ, you're going to end up like this one who it says right in there. He says, I know exactly what happens. I know that there are some of you who are going to be executed. I know that some of you fell. Antipas, 
Antipas among you died because of his faith. I know that. So listen to the theme of the whole letter. The theme is, are you exhausted because you don't know how your needs are going to be met? Without the gods, you don't have the economy. Without the economy, now you're worried. And you know what? One of the great temples up here was the Dionysus temple. You want the God of pleasure? You just want to get fishnickered out of your mind? Are you tired of being so serious? Because they got some great parties at the Dionysius temple. And what's happening is people are being wooed away. And they want to stand for Christ in theology, but not in lifestyle. Because in lifestyle, my theology now becomes costly. So the passage says, he who has a sharp two-edged sword in his mouth is the one speaking. I love that in every one of these letters, Jesus describes himself in a different way. And here, it cuts both ways. Mo By the way, most swords were actually one-edged. The problem with a two-edged sword is you're in tight battle quarters in formation, and when you pull back, you're liable to hit your buddy. And so most swords were single-edged swords. A two-edged sword, quite literally, cuts both ways. And he says, I have a sword that divides between soul and intention, is probably the best translation. In other words, that the Word of God in Hebrews actually cuts between why I say I'm doing what I'm doing and why I'm really doing it. It cuts right down to that level, and it cuts both ways. What's interesting is that uh, the praise here, I know that some of you have stood up for my name. By the way, let us all stop and remember Antipas. He died among you for doing it. Look, it'll cost you everything to follow Jesus Christ in Pergamum. It'll cost you everything. And so the indictment comes down. Some of you are in the era of Balaam. Some of you are in the era of Balak. Some of you are in the era of the Nicolaitans. Very likely, the Nicolaitans is one of two things. Followers of Nicholas from Acts 6, which went on to be people who were permissive of doing ungodly things in order to be accepted. Or they were people who tried to put an elevation of clergy. And we'll talk about that later. The important thing is he goes on and says, I have, in, beyond the indictment, a penalty or promise. To those of you who are in error, I'm going to come with a sword, Jesus says. The gentle Jesus, meek and mild of the Hallmark commercial and card is not this Jesus. From heaven, he says truth matters. Compromise of life matters. And then he says to overcomers, I'm going to give two things. Did you see what they were? What's the first one? I'm going to give you two things. What's the first one? Hidden manna. Now, don't get caught up in what was the manna. Look at the adjective that defined it. I'm going to give you manna, which is bread that comes from me, sustenance, but it's going to be hidden. You trust me for your hope, for your sustenance, and I'm going to fill in your needs, and nobody's going to know outside of you how it happened, and you're going to be amazed that I can. Hidden manna. And then he says, I'll even give you a white acquittal stone. Remember I told you that once a year they would have to come here and they would have to put a pinch of incense in to proclaim emperor as God. Domitian, who's on the throne at the time of John's writing, Domitian was so paranoid that he had the marble of his palace polished so that he could see like a mirror if anyone was coming up behind him anywhere in the palace. He's the one who made them kiss his feet. He's the one who said, you can call me my Lord and my God. Thank you. He's lost in his own head. Vespasian, his dad, was a good emperor. He died early. Titus was a good guy. He died early. Domitian, nobody ever thought was going to be anything, so nobody got him ready, and he ends up the guy. And he is a nut. He's an egomaniac. But he doesn't mind everybody, you know, calling him Lord and God and other, you know, small things. And what happens is, in, if you are caught unwilling to give that incense, you're going to be put in a maestas trial. That trial will summarily have you executed unless an acquittal stone is given at the end of the trial. And the acquittal stone, guess what color it is? White. I'll bail you out in the last hour and you won't know how I did it. 
I'll give you hidden manna, sustenance, you don't know where it came from. And when your back is to the wall, I'll get you out of this. And maybe that will be through death, but I'll get you out. And on there is going to be a name. And it's a secret name, like your pin. Okay? I'm going to give you a secret pin, and you're going to know that I did it. Guys, Christianity isn't a theology. It's knowing, loving, and obeying the person of Jesus. Christianity isn't about getting out of this earthly bondage and falling into heaven where there are streets of gold. It's not about streets of gold. You're dead. What do you need gold for? It's about unending intimacy with Jesus. Christianity is about me growing in this life in unending intimacy so that when I fall into the next life, it's normal. And if I get into the place where Jesus is leading me day by day by day by day, there was a couple of people in our church that when they died, I'm almost certain nothing happened. I'm almost certain they got up and they were virtually the same person because they were that close. Randy, not so much, but there were other people in the church that exemplified what the church should be. I love this. Um, I want you to know, too, that all the provisions of God, Jesus says, he will give us. Athena promised wisdom, but Athena couldn't deliver. Jesus can. Zeus promised power, but Zeus isn't real, and Jupiter can't give you power. And my point is, there are four gods of our age, fortune, fame, power, and pleasure, and everybody I know is sacrificing to those gods. And if you want your hope met, you must find Jesus. And no one will know how, but he will supply you what you need in the hour that you need it. However, he makes no deal of compromise for you to live comfortably on your own for yourself. The deal is, I surrender to him, I get what he gives. And in the end, I tell his story in glory, worthy is the Lamb. That's the deal. So Pergamum, I want you to think of that guy worshiping, and I want you to walk around. We're going to see some more sights. I want to, I want to show you as much as I can, but I wanted it to mean something to you. Otherwise, it's just rocks. I'm actually just taking a look at this, um, this diagram. You get a good view of the theater here, but I want you to notice two major buildings here. Now, we were up here for the Trajanium and the Trion Temple, but I want you to notice down here a massive altar of Zeus over here and next to us an Athena temple right here. So the, the Athena temple is in this area, the altar of Zeus, that if you really want to see it, you've got to go to Berlin. It's very, very beautiful, but it's a massive thing. And if you stand in front of it, it's huge. And it was sitting up on top of here, but it was all lifted off and taken away. So for our purposes, I want you to see every, in every direction, if I look this way, that way, that way, that way, that way, that way, I'm looking at temples in every direction. All you have to do in your preaching is just say, in every direction, there is a temple. And in every temple, there is a bank, a union hall, and a way to get your needs met. And that's the point of the town. Does that make sense? Up top, you got wisdom, you got Athena, but Zeus will be remembered down here. See where the trees are? And you, can you see there's just a small set of stairs? Everything else that belongs to this massive temple, the one of the greatest sources for Zeus or places for Zeus in the Greek world, right here, and gone in Germany. But nevertheless, when people came up, if they walked up around here and came up around the street, this center would have had a huge high altar to Zeus. And when I tell you standing in, in Berlin and looking at it, it is massive. You're just overwhelmed by it. And that's just here before they even get up to the higher temples. So you've got Zeus down here and Athena up there and Trajan up there. There's a library on the far side. But a lot of what's here is about these gods. And it's overwhelming. Think about, you've been to some biblical cities, many of you. I know you've traveled with me. These guys are taking up all their real estate with the gods, the prime real estate going to the gods. Where do you think they're putting their hope? If they put all the real estate, the prime real estate with the gods, that's where their hope is. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Temples were also called treasuries, right? So 
I would just challenge you that this site really, I want you to take away an impression of the site before we go to the second cause for hope, which is the healing center here. Asclepius is the one who uh, Zeus actually raises from the dead. He's the only one of the uh, ancient gods before Isis that has a resurrection theme. But that's one of the reasons that he became a healing center. So there's a temple to Asclepius here. There's also a therapy center. So if you're feeling a little weak, right now would be a good time. We'll check you in to have you an opportunity for some therapy, okay? And we'll show you what the therapy was like back in the first and second century. We know because of the records of the school of Galen what the therapies were like. That's how we uh, can tell you about this. Imagine, though, that Dr. Luke is, in fact, learned in a whole series of things that are so tied to paganism. How does he become a follower of Jesus and still be a doctor when everything you do is tied to some kind of pagan practice? And so just imagine, it cost them a great deal to be Christians. It wasn't easy to be a Christian because there was a strong, strong sense that we're going to serve Jesus by serving people. And if it costs us our life, so what? We have another one. We've got, we've got a spare. Paul really made that point when he said he made death, rendered death inoperative. He made it of no effect. He canceled death. The last thing we're going to fight, the last enemy is death. And interestingly enough, in Revelation, the last enemy that's defeated is, in fact, death. And then death and Hades are cast together and gone. It's important to me to remember that uh, we are in a time when if we're clinging to this life, there's something wrong with our spirituality and what we're doing in our heart. So I think we should really be reconsidering that. Anyway, we're going to a healing center. Okay, so I came into the Propylon, the Propylon, the uh, entry gate of a major city, of any city is a Propylia. If you go to the Acropolis in Athens, to go up to the Acropolis to get to the Parthenon, you gotta go through the Propylia, which is the big gate. So this is a ceremonial gate, and it's built around the thing that tells you that this is an Asclepion. Notice the artwork on here, because that's gonna tell you everything about the place. Look for the snakes, and the snakes go into a ring, and here you'll see two of them are on a ring. And it's not known when you look at the ring exactly what it is, but there is one text that suggests that they were, uh, most of the snakes they used were non-venomous, but they did use snake venom, but they did it by milking the venom. And how did you do that? They did it on a ring. And so you see the ring and it has the look with the two snake heads on top of the ring. And one theory about that is that that's what they were using it for. Very difficult to know. You're coming into the healing center, and let's just talk a little healing if you can. Remember that there is a very thin line between physical, emotional, and spiritual. Um, just recently I was dealing with someone, and when people come for counseling, my first thing was, would you please go to a doctor and get the following blood test? Because three verses for a person who's missing certain things in their body is not going to do it. Smart are the people that understand that the line between physical, spiritual, and emotional is not as clear as we used to think it was. So here, they're trying to do healing of all sorts, okay? Including long-term illnesses, including uh, diseases, but also including mental illnesses. So, you know, if any of, if your roommates may be coming unhinged, now would be a good time to, you know, get them some treatment. Because healing is not only an emotional and physical thing, but because healing is also a, and a religious thing, a spiritual thing, the temple of Asclepius was here. And it sat on a pediment and it sat high. And so when you came down, you came in this way, 
and you went right past a very large temple. It's a circular temple that was up there. It's not been reconstructed, but it's right there on the diagram. I brought you over here because I know several of you, so I thought I'd bring you over to the therapy building. The therapy building is right here, and I'm just gonna talk very quickly about what the therapy is. I'm gonna take you for a moment into an underground chamber to look at the therapy you would have received. Imagine that one of the things they could do would be give you a variety of drugs. Another thing they could do would be have you stare into the eyes of a snake for an hour. Or they could even cause you to go into a kind of frenzied coma and then have non-lethal snakes crawling over your naked body. These are therapies. These are things that should help you. But I'm going to take you through a therapy session for those who were having difficulty locating who they were inside. One of the serious documents we have from the Galen Collection is the therapy of speech. You've heard of people saying that they spoke something into being. Well, that actually was a very pagan idea that people could actually, you could walk through a long therapy session having given, been given certain uh, elixirs and come wandering down this hallway. When you come down this hallway, I want you to walk down quietly. And above you may be a therapist saying, looking good, feeling good. What a great stride. Come take a walk. There's holes above. Looking good, feeling good. Speaking it into being, you are becoming all that you were meant to be. You're losing weight. You're looking younger. You're feeling good. It's actually not you, it's them. You know, I'm, I'm, but I'm being serious about these therapies. These were all serious ancient therapies. Remember that some people got sick and they bled them. This went all the way to George Washington in Valley Forge. The man gets, a si gets sick and they bleed him into a bottle and it says they bled him until the blood ran thick in the bottle. They nearly killed the guy trying to make him well. And what they were trying to do was balance his humors, right? Along with Asclepius, was one of the daughter gods. There are four extra gods that are also represented here. And one of them was Haie, or hygiene, the one we get hygiene from. So remember that water is life and the sacredness of it. And so the place where the sacred fountain would be, people would be using it for cleansing, but also for drinking water in different parts of the city. And it's coming off of an aqueduct that's on the hill that's behind the Asclepion. Now, we don't know why they have a theater here, but there are a couple of ideas. Galen has a statement that some people interpret to be, and what I was taught when I was young was that they actually brought people here to play act a person. They, they thought that one of the ways to get them back to their personality when they had a break with reality was to allow them to play roles. And so that people would do that here. It's perhaps what they use this for. We frankly just don't know. So. It does seem a lot of trouble, but remember, you've got months. So when you come here, you're going to be staying here for months. Now, the other alternative theory is people are here for months. You got to give them TV to watch. OK, and that's the alternative theory. And I, I frankly just don't know. But I brought you here because I think it's well worth it's well reproduced and it's worth seeing. And it's worth the picture anyway. Thanks for visiting with us at Pergamum. I'm sure it was a moving experience to see these imposing ruins, but we look forward to seeing more and more of these seven churches. Join us next time on Exploring the Lands of the Bible.